I'm Joseph, and this is Fish Jelly. I'm all alone today. Nick is still in France at the Cannes Film Festival. So I was very concerned I wouldn't know what to talk about for an hour, but I asked for everyone's help and I got some really good suggestions for topics. So I'm basically going to run through as many as I can in an hour. I will start with Drag Race All-Star 6. So episode four was the Super Bowl halftime show where all of the contestants picked a performer to emulate while reinterpreting one of RuPaul's songs. I thought this was a really good episode. I think everyone did a great job with their performance. The production value was high. It looked like everyone had enough time to practice. I was surprised at who fell in the bottom. Um, I really liked Akiria's Prince. I thought she looked great. She had great energy. So it was really interesting for her to be in the bottom, especially when her runway was killer. Um, I agreed with Yada being in the bottom. Um, and she admitted that her that she seemed distracted. She looked distracted, even though she looked great and her dancing was great. But I also think it was Yada's time to go. She doesn't strike me as... So, she, to me, is more of an artist, not a performer. And I just don't, when I think of like someone being crowned a winner, I just think of someone who would represent the franchise well, someone who could, you know, be given a microphone and host an hour long show or do commercials I, I, and, and interviews. I just don't see Yada being able to do that. She's eccentric, quirky, which I really like, but I think her artistry is probably best served um, on her own terms. So Yada's gone. Um, who do I think should have been in the bottom? I thought Kylie Sonique Love as Steven Tyler, while it was well done enough, it just seems so simple compared to everyone else. I also thought uh, Ginger Minge as Fergie was weaker than Akiria. But at this level of drag, we really are sort of going through everything with a fine tooth comb and it's hard to make a decision. So I'm not going to shit on the judges this go round. Um, a few other things. Jamal Sims is really handsome. So <laughs> I agree with Ginger. I was also dis like, I was disappointed no one chose Janet Jackson, obviously, since she has the most infamous Super Bowl halftime show, but my understanding is the queens chose their own artist. Um, that being said, I do, I do think she would have been such an easy person to choose because of the nip slip, and um, she has very distinct, uh, sort of a, a very distinct dance style. So, yeah, it's interesting that no one chose her. I was disappointed, but whatever. I'm also glad Pandora is doing well because I really like that she, of all the contestants, she's the most low key and it just seems like she's focused on doing her best. And for a sensationalized overproduced competition reality show, it's nice to see someone just do what they're there to do. Uh, as far as the top two, there's Trinity and Jan. So, you know, Jan is not my favorite. No one's going to sell me on Jan, but I can't deny that, you know, she is talented. She can sing and dance. She did a hell of a job as Lady Gaga. I felt like she got the choreography down really well, the the expressions, all that. Her runway was lovely, but Trinity was Beyonce. <laughs> Trinity was Beyonce. Do I agree Jan should have won? Yes, because... Trinity is known for doing Beyonce. So I wouldn't have expected anything less from her. I've watched many YouTube videos of Trinity performing as Beyonce. This is not something that, I mean, this is something that is in her wheelhouse strong. So the fact that she did such a great job is not that impressive considering she's done it a million times. Also, I thought her runway was a little basic. So when I think about the fact that Jan did something that we hadn't really seen her that 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 we haven't seen her do along with a runway that I thought was more uh, creative. I think Jan deserved this one. 
Okay, so moving on to some of the questions I received in the comments of the YouTube post I made. Um, again, I'm just going to try to get through as many as I can. So the downside to living in L.A., uh, obviously traffic is a mess. Traffic, it's so congested. It takes forever to get anywhere. And I think it's funny that people who are not from Southern California who come visit, they'll be like, yeah, girl, I'm flying in on a Friday at like 6 p.m. Can you pick me up from the airport? I was thinking we can head on over to Universal City and then drive to like Venice Beach and go to WeHo. And it's like, uh, no. <laughs> That's not possible. Um, and then the response is like, oh, but it only says it's like eight miles here and six miles there and 12 miles there. Man, a 12 mile drive could take two hours easily in rush hour traffic. During the pandemic, traffic diminished significantly, which I don't want to say was nice because the reason it had diminished is, you know, a global pandemic. So <laughs> there's nothing nice about it. But um, it was interesting being here when traffic wasn't as bad, but it has slowly picked up. And currently, I think it's now that LA is back open for the most part, I I think uh, traffic is probably like 90% back to normal, which is frustrating, <laughs> but I'm used to it. You know, living here, it's really all about timing and kind of getting things done in one fail swoop and you know, most of us have a car. I have a car. So um, really just planning my day around like when I plan on driving is a big part of doing things in L.A. But as I thought about this question, I think the biggest downside is socializing. And it's twofold. One, the logistics of getting around make it really difficult to meet people for like casual social interactions so you know someone saying to me like hey meet me you know like i live in south bay meet me in studio city for happy hour at five o'clock on a wednesday it's like that's not possible <laughs> that is absolutely not possible i'd have to leave like an hour and a half before i'm supposed to meet you there it's exhausting you know because traffic's so bad and everyone commutes no one wants to do stuff after work so that combined with, I think, the, there is a large cohort of people here who have relocated in an attempt to pursue something in the entertainment business. And oftentimes these people don't have steady incomes or their, their, their life is just not stable because everything is unpredictable. There could be an audition, there could be something and it sounds very glamorous, like I know all these people who are doing all these things. And that's, you know, that's not entirely true. I think when we first moved here and we lived in West Hollywood, we met a lot of people who were pursuing entertainment. And it was very difficult to sort of like rein people in and be like, hey, let's plan something for next Thursday at this time. Or let's take a trip this weekend because people just don't know where they're going to be and what they're going to be doing, it would seem on any given day. <laughs> so I think the logistics of getting around combined with meeting people who have a more sort of like regular schmegular life, which is what I have, working like a very stable nine to five job and having a very stable housing and which is another thing, you know, purchasing a home, we're very uh, lucky that we are able to afford a home in Los Angeles, but a lot of people rent and because rent prices are high as hell and can fluctuate, people move often. So it's like, well, you were living on this side of town, but now you've moved 10 miles away. So the, the logistics of all of that, I think is what really makes me want for, um, sort of a more, I don't know, small town feel. The other thing I was going to say about downsides is, when we lived in Minnesota, I have very fond memories of there being places that I called my own, like my favorite coffee shop, my favorite place to get pizza, my favorite Thai restaurant, my favorite movie theater. And not only were there places that I found to be my favorite, but they were accessible. But in LA, no, it's just <laughs> anything that's worth going to is going to be packed. There will always be a line um, because there are so many damn people here. It's 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 just like I can't think of any places that I think are like like that I go to often because they're my favorite because they're just not accessible. So 
I feel relegated to like a few places that I know work well enough and on the odd chance that I want to try something new, I have to be prepared that it's going to be a long wait or parking is going to be difficult. So yeah, those are the downsides. Okay. <clears throat> Bad red carpet hair. I have a lot of thoughts on this, but also I felt overwhelmed thinking like there are so many examples of bad red carpet hair. There is one person I have in mind, but my initial thought was a lot of the bad hair we see on the red carpet tends to be an attempt to execute a more editorial look. And the reality is these, namely like female actors, these are not models. And I know beauty standards for Hollywood are somewhat uh, elevated and skewed. So yes, these actors tend to be maybe, you know, hitting a, a, a different aesthetic than what most people can achieve. That being said, they're still not models. So you get some actor trying to pull off some editorial look and it's like, girl, you don't have the bone structure. You don't have the body frame. You don't have the height to pull this off. So that's usually what I think when I see bad, bad, bad red carpet hair is that we have a person who for all intents and purposes is just regular trying to pull off something that really should be a model executing. But the one person that I'm thinking of, unfortunately, is Halle Berry. Halle Berry, <laughs> there are two moments that really stick out to me. One of them, I can't quite recall the event, but she's wearing a purple strapless gown and her hair looks like straight up Dora the Explorer. <laughs> it's just terrible. The other, I believe, is from the 2017 Academy Awards where she's wearing this big curly mop on her head. And it's so bad. And with Halle Berry, obviously she's a stunning woman. And when she first came on the scene, she was known for that pixie cut and it fit her and her aesthetic so well. And what I noticed starting in like the early 2000s is as they tried to get away from her signature look, which I think was in an effort to make her seem more like relatable in, in roles she was playing. The problem with especially women of color, is that we really need to stick to either your natural texture or straight hair. But it's when we try to give, you know, when Halle Berry wears those like wavy bob wigs with bangs, it's just like, what are we doing here? Because that texture is not, <laughs> that doesn't work for you on any level. That's not your natural hair. And you obviously didn't like straighten your hair to curl it wavy like this. So it, it doesn't work. But also the other thing I think with Halle Berry, and I think this is my advice, I'll get to hairstyling because that was one of the questions later. But when I think about bad red carpet hair, I think the three most important things with the hairstyle for like in general is texture, color, and shape. Those are the three things we really have to consider and how they match the person's um, general aesthetic, their skin tone, their eye color, their like makeup palette. You know, if you're wearing, if you're known for wearing really cool makeup, right? Like really matte tones with like, you know, blue based red, you know, red lip colors and eyeshadows, then you're going to look kind of crazy with like warm, you know, like copper brassy tones on your head. <laughs> so I think these are things that people need to consider. And it's always amazing to me that an A-list celebrity can get on a red carpet who has access to professional stylist, hairstylist, makeup artist, and still come out looking crazy as hell. Moving on, <laughs> fitness. There was a question about fitness. And I think the sort of message was that they think I'm fit, which I find flattering, <laughs> but I also find it funny because in all of the YouTube videos, I'm really only visible from the sternum up. So how you know, how you know what I look like? <laughs> but I appreciate the sentiment. And really, I feel like a fraud because Nick is much more fit than I am. He uh, runs six miles every day. Um, and he's far less of a, a, a pig when he's eating than I am. But the question was about a fitness and nutrition uh, regimen. So I really, I don't have a gym membership. I don't stick to a, in any kind of fitness or diet. So I think considering those things, I'm pretty happy with the body that I have. That being said, I will say I don't have a problem exercising. 
I exercise every day. We have an open space in the back of the house and I have a big workout mat back there and I have a big mirror and an iPad and a weight rack. And every day I go and put on some YouTube video for 35, 45 minutes, just doing like an at-home workout. And that I can do no problem. Any time of day, I can squeeze it in. I'll do it in like my underwear. Like I don't even have to get dressed, brush my teeth, anything. I can just do it. So it's very convenient. I think if I had to go to a gym, I would probably not exercise as much. Um, it just seems like too much effort to get ready, drive. There's probably traffic, find parking, deal with inconsiderate people at the facility. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm lucky that I have the space to be able to work out at home. Um, and even though I would consider myself sort of a lazy person, I definitely don't have a problem being physical. If someone says, let's go for a hike, let's go swimming, let's ride a bike, let's go take some fitness class, I will do it. So I'm lucky in that. I think I'm also lucky that I'm the opposite of a foodie. I could care less. I hear people talking about, oh, this new Korean barbecue place or, oh, this deep dish pizza or, oh, you got to try this whatever. I don't care. I could eat the same three things every day and be fine. My problem is I love sugar. Specifically, if you give me sweets, like if you bring me a cake or a box of cookies, donuts, whatever, I will eat them until they're gone. And I don't mean like, oh, you brought me a cake on Monday and I finished it on Friday. No, I mean like if you bring me a cake Monday morning, it's going to be gone by Tuesday morning. I will just continue to eat it and I won't eat anything else until it's gone. So I've just had to learn, especially as I get older, because it's harder to lose weight, that I need to keep sweets away from my head hole. And, <laughs> and if I can do that combined with a very easy time exercising, you know, I can keep this old sad sack of bones in pretty good shape. What do I do in my free time? You know, this is a question I get asked a lot, like, you know, when people ask about hobbies and interests, and I, I feel so bummed because I think, like, I don't really have a lot of outside interests besides, you know, the things I do with Nick and, you know, being very busy with work and just having a lot of, like, I don't really have a lot of time to do much else. So to me, the idea of like fun free time is me being able to just sort of veg out, like, like if I could just have a day where I don't have to do anything and I can just sit around and watch TV and, you know, maybe go shopping, maybe go for a drive. That to me is like a really fun time. That being said, like in social settings, what I really enjoy is like finding a nice to me, the perfect like socializing thing would be to find a nice, elegant like hotel bar where they're playing like light jazz at a moderate volume and we just sit and drink wine and have a nice conversation. That to me sounds like the perfect, you know, way to spend some free time. TV shows I binge. We don't have live TV, so and I'm not actively watching anything except RuPaul's Drag Race. Um but my immediate thought was there are some shows that I do watch on repeat or whenever they're on, I will keep them on. So Living Single is on Hulu and I started re-watching the entire season and I really like having that in the background when I work. Um, <clears throat> there's a show, a British TV show called Absolutely Fabulous. I know it's on streaming platforms, but I have like every episode and the three movies plus the feature film on DVD. So <laughs> I like to pop those in and just let them play in the background. Lastly, when I am like in a hotel that has, um, it's either TBS, I believe, or BT, they show the television show Martin. And that's something I could watch. Like if it's on, I'm keeping it on. There was another comment about pronouns and I don't know if I read it correctly and if like what I'm being asked to talk about or like how do I feel about pronouns. So I guess I'll just say like when it comes to pronouns, to me it's about respect. I want to refer to people how they want to be referred to. And to me, it's just a matter of respect. Just like it, when I introduce myself as Joseph, I want to be called Joseph. I don't think it's that difficult. Um, there is a learning curve and I think we do need to sort of be patient with people as they learn to adjust. But I do think it's really important to refer to people how they want to out of respect. Also, 
the, you know, hearing people talk about, oh, God, he, she, they, uh, it's too much for me. It, I always think, like, you act like you're constantly being bombarded with interacting with new people. When the reality is, most of us aren't. And those of us who are, like your profession is to interact with new people constantly, part of your job is to handle people with respect. So you better get into it. And for the rest of you, it's like, it's really easy not to gender someone in conversation. It's really easy to not place your ideas of their orientation in conversation. So, you know, if you're not sure, it's very simple. You don't have to go, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, ma'am. You can just say, excuse me. <laughs> and the person will turn around. And you don't have to assume that that person has a husband or a wife. You can just ask if they have a spouse. And what I have found is when people make an attempt to not uh, make assumptions about me, I am very willing to assist them. So, so an example would be if someone sees me wearing a wedding ring and they're curious, like, oh, is he married to a man or a woman? If they say to me like, oh, I see you're married, you know, what's your spouse like? Or how long have you and your spouse been married? To me, that's them showing that they don't want to make an assumption. And immediately I should give them, um, I should do them the favor of saying like, oh, my husband and I, that way now they know, okay, great. This fool's gay. He's married to a man. Now I know. And I think the same goes with gender. When you're meeting a stranger or dealing with people out in public, not gendering them gives them the opportunity to share with you what they're comfortable with. But again, it's not difficult. Like, it's just so crazy to me how people just like will meet strangers and just make all these assumptions like, oh, you have kids, you're married to a woman, you're you're a man. It's like, I'm just here to fucking sell you a dozen donuts. Why are you all in my shit? Like, you don't have to refer to me in any way except be polite and conduct your business and move on. So that's what I think about pronouns. <laughs> um, someone mentioned Too Hot to Handle. I did watch the first season. I know the second season is available. I don't think I'll watch it. While I was entertained enough, I think the premise seems really lazy because... It's like, okay, so you have these group of people who are clearly like sex charged and the entire premise is that if you can keep your hands off one another, you can get this money and somehow they can't manage that. And to me, that is a story about like sexual compulsion. So I think where the show could have really taken it to the next level, and I don't know if they haven't done, if they, if they've done this in season two, but I really wish that they would have had like mental health experts talking about these compulsions and why it's so hard for these people to fucking keep their tongues in their mouths. Like, <laughs> and especially when it's like your coins are at stake, you know, it's one thing to just be bored in a resort with a bunch of good looking people. It's like, yeah, I'm probably gonna, you know, break the rules, but when there's money involved and you still can't go two weeks without taking your pants off, there are bigger issues at hand than just some corny vo voiceover on um, some device telling you that you made a mistake, you're losing a thousand dollars. So yeah, I don't think I'll be watching season two, but I would definitely watch like a recap video to see how it went down. Okay, next topic. What do I get from watching horror or like, why do I like horror films? I think, so there was a transition from being a kid and being deathly afraid of films like any monster movie any scary movie friday the 13th uh nightmare on elm street all the things and because you know i thought those things were real and then you hit i hit a point where i understood like okay monsters aren't real and then going even further me not believing in like demons and spirits or whatever so i think as an adult the reason i like horror is because i'm chasing the high of like feeling fear and things scare me now, right? Like getting an envelope in the mail from the IRS scares me or like, <laughs> or, you know, sometimes driving and thinking like, oh, an uninsured motorist might hit me. And like, <laughs> those are the kind of things that scare me now as an adult. But, um, but yeah, I think I really like horror because it is, you know, like I think the question was asked because I've said that it's my favorite genre is I, I feel like a drug addict chasing a high. Like I just, 
I will watch the shittiest horror films. Like some of these movies we watch, I know they're going to be bad. I can tell from who directed it, from the poster, from the trailer, it's going to be some bullshit. And I will still watch it because I'm hoping that there's just like just one moment where I feel unnerved and my skin crawls. So, yeah, I, I think that's why I chase horror. Second in line, a distant second would be comedy. I like laughing. I love laughing. Um, but comedy is so specific that I'm not as willing to try out any comedy film. But with horror, there's... I would say, generally speaking, there's always at least one moment that I thought was effective. And I'm such a junkie for horror that oftentimes that one moment is enough. So then the question was asked about my favorite horror films. This is always a tough one. My initial thought is, or how I want to answer this question, is the moment when I discovered French art house horror films. And the first one was a film called High Tension. And it just blew my mind. It was so it was so different from anything I had ever seen. So then I went on like this, you know, week long bender of having Nick show me everything he could. So of course there was like High Tension, Shaitan, Frontiers, Martyrs, Inside. These movies really made an impact. Um, but the answer I always give is the OG horror film that scared the shit out of me as an adult, which is the Blair Witch Project. And that's because my stupid ass thought it was real because the marketing surrounding the film at the time was that it was actual found footage. Um, uh, but I think nowadays what really unnerves me are films where what is happening could actually happen. So there's a French film, I believe from 2007 called Them. That one... Um, is very effective in my eyes. There's also a film, another film from 2007 starring Luke Wilson called Vacancy that for some reason I always recall thinking was really creepy. It's about like a couple staying at like a, you know, uh, old raggedy motel off of some highway where they discovered that a snuff film has been made in the room they're staying in. And now the people who made it are after them. So anything that could be real, um, scares me a lot as far as horror genre obviously other topics like slavery the holocaust those things are terrifying and super depressing to watch but if we're just talking about something that's intended to invoke fear nowadays it's really um about things that could actually happen or films that create a really unnerving mood there was another comment about cults c-u-l-t-s and i don't know if like uh, like, I'm not sure if this person wanted to know what I think about cults. Like, oh, they're pretty cool. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about it because I've had some pretty interesting conversations in the past regarding cults. And uh, the short version of it is that I can see how an individual who is in a vulnerable place could really find something within a cult. Because the idea is that they prey on people who are vulnerable and weak at that moment and offer them something they don't currently have. Right. So family community, it could be food, housing. And, you know, I've watched a couple of documentaries on Scientology and the idea. So this is what I would say. If I were in a more vulnerable place, like Joseph today, we're in a more vulnerable place. And maybe I didn't have as nice of a life as I have now. And maybe I didn't really see the kind of future I currently see for myself. And then someone approached me and said, Oh, Hey friend, you look like you, you know, like you need some encouraging words and, oh, you know, I'm part of this group and we really want to look out for each other. And, oh, you need a job. Well, we can get you a job and we can help you with housing and we'll be your friends. I can see how people can get wrapped up into that and it could have a lot of meaning for them, which is scary because I'm not going to make a general statement that cults are like insidious and they're always up to no good. I think what's scary to me is that oftentimes my understanding of what we define as cults are groups where they want to isolate people from the outside world. And I think that's scary because being isolated means that we lose perspective and we also minimize the opportunity to ask for help. So in that regard, I think it's scary. Uh, another question was about why do I always seem quote unquote over it? 
in comparison to Nick, who is more enthusiastic. And I don't know, I, I'm assuming this is like being shady a little bit, but it's kind of silly to me because, you know, if I were actually over it, I wouldn't have, you know, filmed over 500 videos and spent all this time doing the podcast and editing. <laughs> so I'm not actually over it. What I would say is that it's called like our dynamic with one another. The entire reason we decided to make the videos is because in social settings, we would often be told that like our interactions together are really interesting to watch because Nick is oftentimes much more um, animated and enthusiastic and I'm kind of like a downer, but we complement each other well. I know how to rein him in. He knows all my deficits and is always there to support me. Uh, so yeah, it's just our dynamic and it seems to appeal to some people. I would say that, um, you know, if it doesn't appeal to you, then you can, you know, obviously not, uh, partake in it. <laughs> also, I, this is making me want to segue into this idea of people wanting to change everything. Like, like, don't try to change me. Like, like, cause what is this comment implying that I'm going to start acting different or act like Nick, because then I won't be me. And if, if you want someone who's different, then go find that something that's different. But don't come to the Chinese restaurant asking for cheeseburger and french fries. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> go to the burger joint. Uh, another question was about us. Um, have we gotten into trouble from, like, studios about doing spoilers? Uh, the answer is no. I think... So we've definitely received comments from, like, actors and directors who weren't happy with what we said about their films whether they emailed us directly or left comments or, you know, tweeted Nick specifically. Uh, and then publicists have also sort of, you know, made it clear that they weren't, you know, like they were bummed that we didn't like something. But, you know, the issue is, because if we're talking about big studios, like we're nobodies, so we're not on anyone's, like any big studio's radar to be like, you know, we're so upset that you said this, we're never going to give you another screener. And then when it comes to like these smaller indie films that we watch and sometimes eviscerate, the reality is like any attention is good attention, I guess, uh, <laughs> is, is what they say, right? So... No, there have been no repercussions as of yet, but, um, you know, there's always time. <laughs> there's another comment about Erica Girardi. She is also known as Erica Jane. She's on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and uh, she calls herself a singer, a pop star. <laughs> I'm only from, so I have, I used to watch Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I sporadically catch it if I'm staying in a hotel that has Bravo. Um, I also know who Erica Jane is because her makeup artist, Preston, is also Janet Jackson's makeup artist. So that's probably the main reason why she's on my radar. I know she's in trouble right now with, like, embezzlement and uh, involving her husband, who she's in the midst of a divorce from. I... I think I'm going to wait until everything is said and done because I feel like so much of what we're seeing is, like, like the truth is not out there. I know that she participated in a documentary for Hulu regarding the scandal, which resulted in her legal counsel wanting to drop her. But, and, and then I guess they went back and said, no, they would continue to represent her. But I think I'm going to wait until everything is said and done to then really dig in because this shit is a mess. I will say about Erica Jane, when we were first introduced to her on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, I remember thinking like her lifestyle just seems a little too extravagant for like being, you know, I know she thinks she's a pop star, but you know, <laughs> she's no Janet Jackson. So I don't know, like flying private jets everywhere, married to this old ass man who's a lawyer. And also when lawyers have that kind of money, it's also like red flag factory. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know how this ends, but for now I'm not really keeping up with it. Okay, next topic. How do we make our marriage work? I get asked this question all the time, and you would think I would have a canned response, but I don't. <laughs> I think it's really based on how I feel at that moment. Uh, so I'll probably start rambling for a bit. I'll try to rein it in. My initial, like, quick response is 
I make my marriage work because I'm committed to the commitment I made. And I will take it a step further and say, when I agreed to marry this person, and I know we say like, you know, you're saying yes forever till death do you part for better or worse. But, you know, people have irreconcilable differences and sometimes divorce is necessary. So it's not that it's never an option. But for me, I just think like not only did I make this promise, but in making this promise and committing this act, I also had a future in mind for myself. So for me to say like, I wanna dissolve this relationship is also saying like, I wanna wipe out the future I had planned for myself. So this is like major shit. And the fact that people, this is where I'm probably gonna start ranting, but <laughs> let me take a sip of my Coke Zero, hold on. I think it's so easy for people to just bounce from one relationship to the next with no concept of like, where do you see yourself in the future? And, you know, those initial three months when you were head over heels for this person who you wasted two years with, what were you thinking? What were you thinking the rest of your life would be like? Because I think if people thought about that more, maybe they wouldn't... Um, give up so easily because I often think like I want to grow old with Nick that was the plan like I see us being old together I see us having you know a home in LA a home in Palm Springs a home in Berlin I see us traveling a lot I see us getting into all kinds of trouble together I don't want to throw that away because we had an argument today or I don't like the way he, you know, leaves his coffee pot on the, it just is like, or, oh, he did something or this with this person or that person that it, like, I'm mad at you. And no, uh, I'm going to make this work because it's so much bigger than the, the, the little blips we encounter. Um, but so there is a, um, sort of, I don't know how to describe her. I guess she's like a video vixen. Her name is Kareen Steffens, but she's more popularly known as Superhead. Or well, actually, it's Superhead. And she's sort of infamous for having slept with, you know, every rapper and black actor in the game. And then she wrote a book sort of like spilling all her tea. But she was recently interviewed by... Um, a social media personality named La La Milan. And there's a sound clip of her saying that she, whenever she gets married, she never thinks about it lasting forever. She thinks that if someone wants a part of her, like a piece of her life, they have to marry her to get it. And that once they get, like, like once they both, you know, achieve what they set out to do, which sounded like a, and she does say it more like a business transaction, then they separate. And while that's not something that I agree with, I really appreciated her being very um, clear, if she's being honest, about how she sees marriage. And I think, again, while I don't, like that wouldn't work for me with that attitude, I do think people would be better served to take a step back and really evaluate what it is they want from a significant other, where they see themselves in the future, how that person would fit in. And if they're even ready to accept that into their life, everyone's always looking for something. Everyone's like, okay, I'm going to stop my rant, but I'm going to go on a separate rant because I think I was very experienced with men before I met Nick, and so was he. And when I say very experienced, I mean very experienced. <laughs> lots and lots of people. And I know some people might think, like, that's an unfortunate situation, but I think uh, I'm really lucky because my overall thought about those years being single and just dating and having sex with so many people, my overall impression is that there are a lot of really nice people out there. There are a lot of really nice, sweet, generous, thoughtful, kind, attractive, sexy people out there. And that's it. Like there are a, a lot, like, like, like a lot of really nice people out there, but just because someone is nice, just because someone does something sweet, just because someone is good in bed, that doesn't mean that that's the special someone for you. And I think because we both had a lot of experience when we met, 
and there was that deep like sort of connection we knew something special had occurred and my fear for a lot of people who aren't as experienced is that oh you know you had your one boyfriend in high school and then when you were 20 you met this guy and he rocked your world and now you think he's your everything and i'm not saying that can't work i just think that i feel lucky that I have so much experience that I was able to recognize something that was really special. And because I know how special Nick is, I can't let him go. Like, I just can't let him go because I've been around the block a thousand, literally a thousand times. And while everyone was all the things, they weren't special to me. They're special to other people out there, I'm sure, but not to me. So I think just really committing to the commitment, executing the future I saw for myself, and really knowing that I found something special that I just can't let go of. <sighs> okay, let me take another sip. The next topic, I get a lot of questions about being a hairstylist. Um, so I am a licensed cosmetologist. I didn't always set out to be one. So I went to undergrad. When I finished college, I took a job working in VIP services at a casino in Las Vegas. And I spent four years doing that. It was amazing. I have a million stories about all the, the high rollers and the celebrities and all the crazy shit I had to do. That could be three episodes in itself. So I won't get into all that. But while I was working there, I met someone, a surgeon who lived um, out of state, and he wanted to be with me and did all the things, made all the promises, which was somewhat serendipitous because the casino I was working in had filed bankruptcy, and they had been purchased by Starwood Properties, I believe. So it was going corporate. So all the shenanigans we were pulling Again, I have a million stories. I was making so much money doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, which was only possible because I was working for this private property that was clearly in financial ruin, so no one was checking for anything. But I knew once it went corporate, all of that was going to go out the window. So me making, you know, an insane amount of money was going to really go back down to like, I make $16 an hour. So I knew I couldn't do that. And then I have this person here promising me like this beautiful life. So I took it. And part of that was him wanting me to go to medical school. So I did all the prereqs, took the MCAT and got into medical school. So I did two years of med school, dropped out. Part of me dropping out, which is an, an entirely different story, but um, part of that process was like, okay, if you're going to stop doing this, what are you going to do as far as a career goes? And I remembered being, you know, 18 years old in Las Vegas in college and thinking that I had a really good friend named Michael who was a hairdresser. And I always envied him. He seemed to have such a nice life. You know, he made good money. He had a beautiful house he bought and a car. And we were the same age. And... Well, he was 19, I was 18, but he had all these amazing things. And then seeing him at work, he just seemed so alive and people loved him and he made his own schedule. So I, I think when I thought like, okay, well, I'm not going to be a physician. What do I want to do? Instantly, I thought be a hairstylist. So the day I left med school, uh, the next day I went to a beauty school near walking distance from our house. And I just enrolled. It was that simple. And that those 1,600 hours I spent in beauty school, I think, were some of the best moments of my life so far. I had so much fun with the other students. You know, I was a non-traditional student. I don't think it's, you know, here I am, you know, having just left grad school, medical school, to go to beauty school. And... You know, most people in beauty school are not the most scholastic. So that was good and bad, but I think it was mostly good because I just got to be around like different kinds of people who were so much more fun. I was, I learned so much so fast. 
because I did have a strong science background, the science behind hair is really what appealed to me. And I really excelled in that area. So I just loved it. And because I was a little older than the average beauty school student, well, a lot older, and I'm male, because unfortunately, even in beauty, men seem to fare better. When I graduated and got my license, I hit the ground running and I actually had my own studio um, and it was just a lot of work. And to be honest, uh, it, I just, okay, what I like about doing hair is those clients who are really sweet and nice and appreciative and, you know, the instant gratification of doing something and being told, yeah, I love it. You did a great job as always. And then they hand you money. <laughs> It's like, what can be better than that? Like, you get to perform your craft, you get praised, and then you get money. But I'll probably rant about a couple things. The first thing I think I want to rant about is, <clears throat> as a society, I think we put a lot on service workers. And service workers run the gamut from bartenders and restaurant servers to hairstylists, massage therapists, makeup artists to doctors, dentists, pharmacists, like these people are performing services and we put a lot on them beyond their actual task. And as a hairstylist, I felt like I was a therapist, a social worker, a drug counselor. Uh, <laughs> it was a burden. It was a burden. And some clients didn't know how to walk that line of being appropriate and friendly versus like just weighing me down with all their stuff. And when I tell you people would come at me with their most intimate secrets and like really heavy, heavy stuff, like we're talking infidelity, abortions, miscarriages, like just all, all like domestic abuse. And it's, it's hard to deal with that. It's hard to absorb it. And to be for, because I'm being held hostage, right? If you plop your ass down into my chair and need your roots retouched, well, that's, you know, that's an automatic 45 minutes of me applying your color and letting it process where I'm held hostage. Then I have to wash the shit out and blow dry it. That's another 30 minutes. So it's like, you have me for 75 minutes just bombarding me with this heavy, heavy stuff. And I have to somehow make you feel okay about it. And I always felt like that was really hard. And that expectation on top of how physically challenging doing hair is standing, you know, if you're busy <laughs> and working all day, it's really hard on the body. Um, and the older I'm getting, I just can't do it. So I have stopped doing hair. It's been now, well, since right before the pandemic, I've been given an amazing opportunity to still work in the hair business, but doing something entirely different that has afforded me and will afford me some really awesome opportunities as I continue to grow. So I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, I, I don't want to do hair. It would take a lot for me to bust out my shit and do someone's hair. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot of money. So it wouldn't even be worth it. What's next? What's next? I have a few minutes left. Oh, my most hated movie. Uh, that's hard because, and this drives Nick crazy, I will turn off a movie in a heartbeat. I will sit and watch like 45 minutes of something and then turn it off because I don't like it. So <laughs> there are so many examples of me doing that that I can't even pick one. However, when I think about most hated movie, I think about uh, one of the first times Nick took me to see a movie, he took me to see The Tree of Life by Terrence Malick. And I sat there for maybe like 30 minutes and I walked out. And it's not because it was like the worst movie ever. I think it, and this relates to us doing spoiler videos. I like to know what a movie is about before I watch it because then I feel primed and ready and can pick up on the details and get myself hyped for it. So I feel like it it enhances the experience and the story if I know what I'm getting myself into but so many times Nick has convinced me to watch something and he won't tell me what it's about and I didn't look it up and it's like I'm not prepared and the tree of life I was not ready so I walked out of that damn theater 
<laughs> the last topic I'll spend time on is Janet Jackson. Everyone talks to me about Janet Jackson. Everywhere I go, everyone knows I love her. So <laughs> I can talk about her any day, any time. But since I know it can be tedious, I'll just leave the last um, few minutes for her. Why do I love Janet? I think it's it's kind of... I just feel like the stars aligned because when I think about being a young person, right, like an adolescent, we all, you know, glom on to something. I think about, I always use the example of my sister being really into the band Four Non Blondes and their one single that she played on repeat for a month. And it's like, they didn't really have any hits after that. So it just kind of died. It was the same for me. Like I bought the Control album. I really liked it. And that could have been the last that she did. But I just happened to choose someone who continued to work and make hits and do other things and go on these amazing tours and provide me with so much content that it just, you know, transitioned from being an adolescent to a teenager to a young adult to an adult. And she's still giving me everything I need without having done really anything problematic enough for me to not want to align myself with her, or support her. So I, I think it's just luck that I chose someone who really has built such an amazing career. Um, there was a question about my favorite videos. The Rhythm Nation long form video that won the Grammy for best long form video. Um, I think that's my favorite work from her. And it's like a 30 minute film that features the videos for it has a story throughout, but within the story, there's the video for Miss You Much, The Knowledge, and Rhythm Nation. I That, to this day, just blows my mind. Like, the vibe, the songs, it's just, it's, it's just a moment, and it's so great. Um, other videos that pop into my mind immediately are If. Um, that I can watch at any time. She looks so good. The choreography is iconic. I really like the video for Rock With You. Um, from the Discipline album. I really like the video for All Right from the Rhythm Nation album. Um, oh, also, if you have access to um, getting a hold, uh, I, I still have the VHS copy of the Rhythm Nation long form video, but if you can get access to it, there is a behind the scenes documentary of the making of the video, which is actually longer than the video. And it's also really worth watching. So I'd recommend that. There was a question about Janet's hairstyles. I will say this, you know, in the 80s, weaves for black women were a little limited and they all sort of had the same look, you know, so I, it, those looks are very dated. They obviously didn't age well. And, you know, that kind of hair, that style of sewing and weaves back then with the quality of the hair they had access to, um, you know, they didn't move as well as they should have. So, not my favorites. And then we transitioned to the early 90s with the Janet era and that natural curly hair she wore for almost all of that project, um, minus the box braids, which I loved, um, I, I think is such a great look for her. Then she transitioned to the Velvet Rope era, still staying with the natural textured hair, but then she was doing that vibrant red color with makeup that I thought was kind of garish. I really didn't care for that. Um, the early 2000s, she was really into like her long, Janet likes weaves over wigs. It's rare she wears wigs. I think the only time I could probably pinpoint a wig is like the discipline era when she was wearing a lot of bangs that were either with like curly texture or that long stringy kind of flat hair. I'm assuming those were wigs, but um, yeah, she likes her weaves. And those I don't know age very well, like the All For You era with the chunky highlights and then like the Demita Joe. Um, that hair looked fine. It's definitely for the, for, for the time. I think Janet's hair journey um, has peaked the last five years. Her hair has never looked better with the natural texture, with the light brown and then the light brown copper color. She looks amazing. I love this hair so much. I can't wait to see what she does next. I also really like when she wears her braids, which she only seems to do when she's in between projects. So like when you see her at like little small events, um, she'll sometimes have braids. I, I wish she would do those more often because they look so good on her. 
Um, but that's, I think, all I'll be able to get to for today. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm not exactly sure on what day Nick will be returning. So I don't know if he's going to be here next Sunday. I think he will be. If he is, obviously, we'll talk all can stuff. And I'm hoping tomorrow, Monday, I'll get to get on a Zoom call with Nick and we can talk about what he's been up to um, at the festival. So that should be a video coming. We also have a couple of videos dropping tomorrow on Monday. So there's more stuff coming out. But anyway, thank you for listening. Bye.